Thank you all for uh, coming out this morning, um, just in time for the cold front. <laughs> I'm Phyllis Ingram, and I am the Voter Services Director for the League of Women Voters San Antonio area. Um, I would like to thank some people for helping to put this together today. Um, Lainey Shearer, please stand up, is the president of the Vineyard Homeowners Association. Where did Charlotte end? <laughs> we have now cast SA here today, who is going to be um, taping, and then by Monday it will be up on their YouTube site. So if you know anybody who wanted to be here but couldn't, they can see it that way. I would also like to thank Connects IT and Networking for providing the sound system this morning. And uh, <laughs> uh, the format was mailed out in advance to the candidates. Um, they have agreed not to address comments to or about each other. All questions will come from the moderator, who will be me. Um, and they'll be on um, written three by five cards. There are some in the back of the room. And Gina and Tinji also have some, so if you'd like one, just raise your hand and she'll bring it to you. Um, I'd like to introduce Steve Ingram with League of Women Voters, who will be the timekeeper today. And Gina Ratinji with the League of Women Voters, who will be sorting questions. And we don't sort to eliminate questions, we sort to eliminate duplication. So um, if your question has already been asked in one form or another, it probably won't be repeated. Um, so with that, let me introduce the candidates that we have here with us today. Um, all the two candidates have agreed to be here. Uh, and one is not here yet, or two are not here yet. <laughs> so we'll start with John Courage, Dr. David Cohen, Patty Gibbons, Matt Pena, Marco Barros. <laughs> I think you're going to be here. Um, Mr. Von Dolan had indicated that he would be here. He's not here yet. Uh, Dr. Bert Ciccioni, and last but not least, Sandra Martinez de Armand. So we are going to start with a two minute opening statement. When the speaker has 20 seconds remaining, Steve will hold up a yellow folder to let them know that. And when their time has expired, he will hold up a red folder. And I would ask that you uh, be mindful of that so that we can get in as many questions as possible. So, I'm going to be in a challenge. <laughs> person in the nonpartisan office. How can you separate your personal politics from the office? <laughs> Thank you. I think the wind scrambled my brain. Yes, we will start with two minute opening statements. We'll start with Mr. Courage. Thank you very much. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I, I'm really pleased to see the League of Women Voters do this in districts all around San Antonio. I think they have, thank you, I believe they have a great reputation at uh, trying to help educate voters about the races that are going on. For those of you who don't know me, again, my name is John Courage. I'm a 20-year resident of San, uh, District 9, over, <coughs> excuse me, 40 years in San Antonio. I'm an Air Force veteran. I've been teaching for the last 27 years. Uh, I, I teach at Little Flower Catholic School. Years I taught in SAISD. I'm married and I have uh, four grown children, uh, and they're all out doing different things today. I have four grandchildren. Hopefully, they're in from the cold. And I've been involved in San Antonio and involved in community activities all the years I've been here. I was elected to the Allen Community College District Board of Trustees and served there and was on the committee that decided to build the first college on the south side of San Antonio, Palo Alto College. I also served on the San Antonio University Commission. Uh, as a teacher for many years, I served on San Antonio Teachers Council Board. Uh, 
uh, been involved in, in my community from being a referee in softball and baseball and basketball games to being a Boy Scout leader uh, to being a youth group leader at my church. Uh, and so to me, community is everything. What I've done over the last few months is ask people in our district uh, what they think are the important issues, why they want to have somebody uh, represent them who understands those issues. Uh, and so I believe I can do that as your neighbor on the San Antonio City Council. Thank you. I'm Dr. David Roy, and I'd also like to thank the League of Women Voters for inviting us here today and inviting you all, and I'd like to thank you for your participation in our democratic process. I'm a native San Antonian, born and raised here at MacArthur High School. I'm married to my wife, Debbie, who is here. We've been happily married for 40 years and have five sons. Uh, I am an Army veteran, and I retired from uh, the Army after 20 years of active duty and 10 years of reserve. Uh, I was a trauma surgeon and a heart and lung surgeon in the Army, Chief of Cardiothoracic Surgery at the Army Medical Center for many years. I'm also an engineer and have a background in bioengineering and research in that area. I've been an educator uh, as well. My background for public office is I've been serving the community as a military officer for most of my life. I've served as a Brigadier General of the Texas State Guard and have been involved in disaster management and planning not only for San Antonio and South Texas, but for the entire state of Texas. And I had earlier in my life won a scholarship in, uh, to the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, and I have a Master's in Public Administration degree which has uh, stimulated my interest in running for office and continuing to serve you on the San Antonio City Council. I believe that I bring a unique background to the City Council that would be important in a city whose number one industry is health care and biotech and whose number two industry is the military. And I hope that you'll consider me for this important office. Thank you very much. Come, don't get seated, and then we continue on with our two-minute openings. Ms. Gibbons. Good morning. I'm going to thank you for having me, sir. But I do appreciate the breeze. I think it's a more mild us look. I'm Patty Gibbons, and I'm running through the City Council here in District 9. I'm the President and CEO of Gibbons Surveying and Mapping. We're a land surveying land development company. We've been in business here in San Antonio since 1991. Along with my husband, Gary, he's, uh, him and I have been married for 38 years. We have six children and seven grandchildren. My children are all grown and gone. Gone. Uh, land development is big in San Antonio. If you think about it, we develop just about everything the city does. Sidewalks, curbs, streets, sewers, drainage ditches, Besides developing subdivisions like this, multi-faceted subdivision, multi-use subdivisions, the city is always thinking big, and it's thinking about growing right now. So that means that I would like to bring to city council the knowledge that I have learned over the last 26 years of how this development happened, what are the processes that it goes through. When it goes down to the city council is where it gets approved, but behind the scenes, when it goes to city staff, where it gets reviewed, and how does it get reviewed? How does it get out here and get executed? Where are the politics behind that? Why do we say to ourselves, why are you tearing up my road when we just paved the road? Why are you saying to yourselves, why did they put the street there and not over here? And those are the things that happen behind the scenes that I'm very, very familiar with. And I want to bring that to city council. Help facilitate our development smartly, wisely, and keep the big thought in mind as well. I'm Patty Gibbons. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Pena. I'm a long-term resident of District 9. In fact, I was raised here. So uh, my, my elementary, middle, high school, they're all here at District 9, and I'm quite proud about that. Um, I think I definitely represent the values that this community has to hold. I worked hard. I got my BA in political science, and I definitely understand a little bit about policy. Uh, I think at this point, if I could teach it, I should be able to do it at least at a professional level. Uh, you know, I've worked with the East Asian Institute. That's something a lot of people don't know. It's uh, one of San Antonio's sister cities. It's Kumamoto, Japan. And we've worked with a lot of consulates bringing them here and uh, letting them learn to love this city the way I have. And I'm, I know the way you do. Um, but I'll, I'll put it this way. This, uh, I have been never more proud to be a member of this community than I am standing against these candidates. This has been uh, quite an experience. Uh, I am more impressed because I wish a lot of our candidates could be spread out throughout the city instead of just living in this one uh, area. Um, and actually, that is one thing I'd like to change. I would actually like to change the fact that I believe that we actually need more council seats. And it's because our voice goes unheard uh, many times. In fact, we're, uh, our district is quite conservative, and uh, most of the times we're one of two or three votes on the city council. Uh, that happens, you know, and, and we ask ourselves, you know, what can we do? Because well, especially at the city level, it's about money. It's not about, it shouldn't be about politics. It should be more about money and what's going on. But it gets brought in there anyways. See, and that's, that's where I, I think my strongest standpoint is, is because I definitely understand about how to make a good, fair policy that treats everyone with respect and honor. And that's something that I want to pass on to you guys. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Marco Barros. Uh, I appreciate the invitation, fellas, and uh, the league and the neighbors. Uh, a little bit about myself. I am a resident of uh, District 9 for the past 30 years. I, uh, my, both of my sons are now grown. Uh, my wife and I have been involved in the community for many, many years. Uh, we are uh, involved in many aspects of the community. I've been uh, serving on many city boards and commissions for the past 20 years, so over seven boards. My last board that I'm still involved is uh, I'm the vice chair for the San Antonio Airport Advisory Commission, so my focus is to improve the airline service uh, to San Antonio, to and from San Antonio. Uh, so, being in, in District 9 for 30 years, I'm very familiar with the challenges, uh, the streets, drainage, water, traffic, and public safety. Uh, three of the, uh, my, uh, we'll talk about this, but three of my priorities is I have worked on public safety for many, many years. In my personal role of uh, uh, executive director for an organization, I've worked for 225 different companies. And one of the things I do every single day with restaurants, hotels, it's about safety, public safety, and I work for the San Antonio Police Department very, very close. Uh, in talking to a lot of neighborhood associations, over 20, and so many residents, I visited with about 4,000 residents in District 9. Public safety is the number one issue. Uh, we're short in police officers right now, about 225, 240, depending on who you ask. So we do have a shortage both in the fire department, the police officers, and those are the things that we really need to face. So I know we'll talk more about this, but Marco Barros, thank you for attending this morning. Good morning, Nani. My name is Patrick Von Dolan. Uh, my wife and I are happy. Met at Texas A&M University in both class of 1992. My wife's first one from San Antonio, uh, Churchill, class of 88. I'm, I'm a uh, fifth generation native Texan and uh, proud to have, as we celebrated the Battle of San Jacinto yesterday and Aggie Muster, um, my uh, have a relative who was actually a physician in Goliad, who was taken from Goliad to San Jacinto, his, his life was spared, and uh, to work and, and help um, both sides, uh, the Mexican Army and Texans, uh, to uh, be, be healed. And uh, so we, that was an important day in our Texas history. The freedoms we enjoy today, we owe to those people who fought and died for our freedoms, and, and a, a great day to remember them. 
as I said, my wife and I uh, met at Texas A&M University, and then uh, after dating for a little bit, we uh, married in 1996, moved to San Antonio in January 97, and lived in the same area since. We've been blessed with nine children, and so we have our own little city council. And uh, well, I'm not sure who the mayor is. My wife would like to think she's the mayor, but I think my teenagers like to take over. Man, my, uh, uh, in doing that, uh, I've been a financial planner for uh, over 20 years and uh, partner in a financial planning firm where we bring financial science to our clients for an annual fee. One of the things that we've done, and I'm sorry I didn't get here with it today, um, the, uh, we created a, went back and looked at the city budget since 1977. And up until 84, we had a balanced budget. And until that, at 84, we departed from that budget again, finding zero budget. And in, our, in 2005, we had a huge tax burn rate acceleration. And if we pass the bond package in total, it will put us on a trajectory to surpass our total assets within the next 20 years, potentially. So I'm very concerned from the financial perspective on what our city can do and how to go forward. So Patrick Mondolin, vote Patrick out of for more information. Thank you for your attention. It is great to be with you on a warm yes. San Antonio morning. I should have stayed in this place. Very briefly, I'm a retired from the first time I've ever done before. And I've been in business for about 25 years making titanium castings for implants and replacement teeth. Uh, rather than talk about myself, I'd rather talk about four issues that I think are very important for District 9, other than the weather. And the first is to keep traffic moving. Often we think the way to keep traffic moving is to build more roads and to build more roads and get more cars. So we better begin to lay the groundwork on how we're going to keep the traffic moving that we have today. Uh, if we did it, a couple of possible ways that we could begin is we can make Highway 130, that toll road that goes from Sabine to, to uh, Austin that nobody thinks. We can make it a designated truck route, of which it's, uh, it's no, no toll for the truckers. We give them an offer that they can pass up and quote some of my ancestors on that one. And we also get the buses filled. But most of the buses that travel by here are rather empty. And we can give our senior citizens and students via buses to, to generate ridership. We might as well put bodies in those buses and those seats that go on the city. Another important issue is the chapter that talks about is, is public safety. And uh, we on city council create the policies that, that are directly affect public safety, such as we should have a policy where we're going to fully staff our police officers, officers and that will have a great impact for all of our neighborhoods all over the city, a positive impact. Another issue that's very important for District 9 is we need to increase our number of districts. In 1951, when our charter was passed, we were a city of about 400,000, and we had covered less than 100 square miles. Now we're four times larger, and we still have only 10 districts. And one other, one other point I want to make is we have too many elections. If we would consolidate, if we would move our city elections from odd to even numbers, we would save about 1.2 million uh, every other year. And that red car is up, and I have to stop because I always listen to all this. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Oh. 
color at this point. So um, he does struggle with something called Asperger's. Um, now it's on the autism spectrum. He just is really intelligent. So if you tell him, like, I fired my nanny once upon a time, we say, oh my God, you set our nanny on fire. He takes things very liberal. Anyway. So I was born and raised here in San Antonio. My parents were immigrants from Mexico. Uh, we just loved Ronald Reagan at the time because through um, amnesty, they were able to become citizens of, of this great nation. And I was able to educate myself. I say myself because my parents didn't have the money. And so I went to UTSA, I went to St. Mary's, and I currently hold a license in marriage and family therapy or a licensed professional counselor. I'm also a chemical dependency counselor. There are many issues that, that are very pressing, and I do not want to take any more time. I think that we're going to get into um, the press of things here shortly. So I do ask humbly for your vote. And again, my name is Sandra Martinez D. Martin. Thank you. I apologize to all of you who don't have blankets. <laughs> so we're going to start our first question with Dr. Cohen. <laughs> The position of city councilman is a nonpartisan office. How can you separate your personal politics from the office to represent all constituents, even those who you may not agree with on a specific issue? Any examples of doing so in your past experience? Well, thanks for this question. Uh, first of all, it's very easy for me to do that as a military officer. Uh, my entire career has been spent being completely nonpartisan and apolitical. And that is an important part and one of the characteristics of our military that separate, separate the United States military from those of uh, dictatorships around the world. So I'm happy to be able to say that that would be an easy thing for me to do. And as San Antonio, as I said, I grew up here as a long tradition of nonpartisan city government, starting with the good government leader. When I grew up, there were no Democrats or Republicans running for city office. And in fact, I think that's a great thing, and it's the way it's supposed to be. Two previous recent mayors, uh, Mayor Cisneros and Mayor Castro, have changed that and have injected partisan politics into the city council. And their uh, ambition to run for uh, Thank you, Dr. Cohen. senior office has been uh, Thank you, Dr. Cohen. <laughs> Um, I neglected to say at the start of this, these answers are now one minute long. Okay. You know, when you're a mother, you and both six children in a large family, you have to watch your politics. You have to be open-minded. You have to realize everyone is an individual, and some are going to go this way, and some are going to go that way. When you're in business and you work with other clients, there are they too have their own set of politics. So I've always been one to be open-minded. Always been one to listen to the other side, bring it to the table. I'm a leadership where I like a lot of voices at the table. Whenever I'm in committees or chair committee, I like large committees because then we get multiple voices. I think when you are small, you won't you will only hear the you only hear the small the small part and the stuff's gonna come up. But I like large committees. I like to hear a lot of outside voices. Well not in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, how do you separate it? Well, here's the good thing for me is I don't have to. Uh, you know, as part of me understanding politics is understanding political philosophy. I'm quite bad at teaching it. See, for me, one of my guiding principles is called direct and liberative democracy. What that means is that it's not my voice as a representative that matters, it's yours. At the end of the day, it's your voice that matters. And see, what you do here is that you have to have somebody in office that's willing to facilitate great roles that can actually make their voices more heard. Because 
because we know that uh, eventually you end up with someone in, in power who ends up making a decision that you just put why. It's not listening to the community at all. And that's, that's the part about understanding the rules, how to change them. And that's what's so great about having that good understanding is that I know I can facilitate those things for you guys. Thank you. Very, very, uh, very good question, by the way. Uh, I've been doing this for 20 years, so I've been uh, experienced about working with all 10 council members in different projects in the city. Uh, the best example I can give you uh, that comes to my mind, although the San Antonio missions are based at close to the districts three, four, and five, I work on the World Heritage designation with the 12 different organizations and I brought them all together. And the key to all this is working together in partnerships. So uh, it, we all benefit when we work together because remember, you have to have six votes in city council to pass to approve any city ordinance. So you really have to create those alliances early and work with all the 10 districts. Well, as one of my advisors that told me uh, years ago, there's things that are politics and opinionable and political, and there's things that are intrinsic. And so one third of our decisions we can make that are, I have, we have to represent uh, the citizens of District 9, because there are things that cannot be, uh, that District 9 has to have. The other part is the parts that are near and dear, that are intrinsic, not above politics. And, uh, and then there's those things we can give on for what's good for the city. Uh, I'm the only one of the candidates here who has actually passed an ordinance. And uh, in December 17, 2015, there was a high, high, highly politically sensitive issue where the April Surgery Center moved in next door to uh, Dream Hill Estates neighborhood on 2140 Bathtop. And I, uh, with a team of volunteers, we successfully petitioned and, and earned seven votes, and one of us set the floor across the aisle and to, to help protect residential neighborhoods so that you wouldn't have major intense use businesses move in next door that would, that would impact and devastate a local community. Thank you very much. Patrick, I like it better when you're standing up and block the wind. <laughs> <laughs> my, my criteria on, on city council would be very simple. I'm the first to want to know what is best for the, for the citizens of District 9, and what is secondly, what is best for the city, and that is what I would go on, regardless of what my personal opinions may be, or the personal opinions of any of the colleagues. I'm so fortunate that I took a great course. It took a couple of days to actually be certified. And what I am is a court appointed uh, mitigator between parents that are acrimonious and what they're asking about. And those are very challenging. And I figured if I could do five years of that, um, I'm definitely good at, uh, or the skill set that I bring to the table has more to do with mediating and bringing people together. Um, I also am very fortunate to be a, a woman, and I've got something called intuition. And sometimes you know when you can decipher that there is a shadow vision that some people may have that is not beneficial for our community. They just may be targeted for their own pockets. And so that, my friends, I say, intuition is a very, very large part of decision making. I thank you anyway for this great question. It's it's a it's a question that's very difficult because these people here are partisans. I do think it's a good question. I've been campaigning for months. I've talked to thousands of people and thousands of homes. And once in a while, I have someone say, well, are you a Democrat, are you a Republican, what is it? And this is what I've been telling people. Now, before I answer that question, let me ask you a question. Is there a conservative or a liberal or a Democratic or a Republican way of filling the pothole in your street or replacing the light at the corner? And most people realize there really isn't. Uh, 
I've been asking people what their concerns are because I want to be your neighbor on the city council who understands the concerns in your neighborhood and in our district and will respond to those, not to special interests or particular interests. I believe I can work with any mayor. I believe I can work with any city council person. We have to work together. We need to collaborate. We need to work together because I also believe this, a city councilman for any district is truly a city councilman for the whole city because the decisions that are made by city council affect the lives of everybody in San Antonio.
extend further uh, and not just have a bill that passes, but we need to make sure we have Texas, and Texas turnarounds, U turns. We need to make sure we have right turn lanes. We need to make sure that while we have barricades going down 1604, uh, we need places where police can still turn around and uh, pursue uh, people that they need to pursue. And so those barricades in the middle of 1604 are great uh, to help protect the traffic. At the same time, we need, we need police to be able to get through. Uh, one thing we do is we never toll a tax lane already. 1604 is has been paid for your tax care dollars, and we need to stay in the state where it's not told. Thank you, Brad. Uh, two steps. Short term, we need to keep our traffic moving because autos do not move on concrete alone. You can't build more roads and more roads and think that will solve the traffic problems. You won't until you solve your immediate problems of how do you get the traffic moving. And on long term, I think perhaps for District 9, I think it would help. Uh, 1604 would be check the feasibility of getting your road bill to connect Keebner with 410 South and Ice Eisenhower Park. And that would take up, up relieve a lot of the traffic off the off the 1604. That is where's Bob's help uh, 410 tremendously because it's the only other east west throughway going from 35 to the middle So we need short term park uh, planning and long term planning. Really good question and a question that we've been hearing across uh, this district during our uh, phenomenal, it's been uh, up and down uh, with this great election. I will say this, um, it's going to take teamwork. I used to think San Antonio City Council was the HOA of downtown. Uh, only because there was not a whole lot going on around. It seems like all the money is at this time for actually going to the state town. I think it requires teamwork, not only by the city, also. We have commissioners for it. We've got legislators. We've got Congress. And we need someone that is able to have those much needed skill sets to be able to have those or forge an alliance or coalitions so that we can better our rights. So it starts with the leadership of the individual that is going to represent you in city council. And that's why I still ask you for your vote. It is important and thank you very much. I think the next city council person needs to make sure they're involved with uh, traffic planning by being part of the Metropolitan Planning Organization and the Regional Mobility Agency. Both of those are very involved in, in getting the funds necessary to improve our roads. We need to widen 1604. We need to put some high occupancy vehicle lanes on 1604, which will allow people with more people in it to get in those lanes, but also will allow our bus transportation to expand and put express buses around which will give opportunities for people to travel more. We need to really get behind improving VIA. We want to have VIA be the kind of service that you can take to go downtown or to go from one part of the town to the other. And the city has neglected VIA over the last 20 years. So I think that's another important part. Also, we just need to go ahead and stop the tremendous growth all over the north side that's adding so much. We need to have smart planning where we have more development in other areas of town where there's better transportation facilities available, roads that aren't being used. That's a long-term plan, but short-term help with uh, MPO and RMA. I've got to say I completely agree with what John has just said. The city council appoints the members of Hayler Bird Lease to the Metro planning organization and despite community opposition they keep coming back with the same recommendation over and over that they want to put toll lanes first on 281 which we've now defeated and now on loop 1604. Toll lanes will not solve the problem for several reasons. Number one is people don't want to use them. Right. Bert just talked about the fact that we have this billion dollar road going from Seguin to Austin. If you've ever driven on it, there are almost no vehicles on it. Yet Interstate 35 remains congested, so it's a huge amount of money that has been wasted. Secondly, uh, it is unfair. Why should people in one part of 
account, pay tolls, to go to work, to school, to go shopping, and people would pay the same gasoline tax, which is supposed to go for road construction and maintenance, pay no tolls, increase the gasoline tax if necessary, and build more free lanes on 1604. Okay, next question, we will start with Matt Pena. Will you fight to protect the San Antonio Ordinance prohib prohibiting discrimination against LGBT communities? So, for, for me, here's my honest response. I do not think government should be making rules or regulations for businesses or people in general. That's my stance on it. It's very much a nonpartisan stance because they put this bill as a way to both either control what the public does or control what businesses do. Um, I think people are better at solving that issue and setting up their own rules in their own stores. Uh, they're just better at it. And, you know, if, if you have somebody who doesn't want uh, the LBG uh, community inside their store, well, that's up to them. If you want somebody who's the opposite who wants them in the store, that should be up to them. As a, that's what it means to be nonpartisan. That's what it means to make it fair. That also means to make sure to protect the businesses that are there as well. Thank you. I have a feeling that this uh, city ordinance, and like many others, we're going to come back um, with in, in the fall again. But I can tell you personally, um, I would probably uh, favor a non-discrimination uh, city ordinance. I think that we need to treat all the citizens the same way, men and women. Every human being deserves to be treated with dignity, respect, and protected. And based on city government in any form of any political community uh, is uh, duty bound and responsible for help protecting the family. And uh, so it's important that we make sure that in enacting laws, that in major city ordinances like that, we take it to the will of people and, and to do that. I personally worked against the, the non discrimination ordinance. You know, for numerous reasons that I don't have time to explain here today. But one of those things is uh, government has a, a, a premise to help support and, uh, and uphold marriage between one man and one woman, hopefully for life. And it pr produces a family and has fruits of that. So we have a future. Without that, we, we do not have a future. But every person needs to be treated and protected and they're respect, uh, respected and have dignity uh, to live life and we've got our government interference. But how government goes about Dealing with that needs to be done very carefully. Thank you. I think that excuse me, all of our citizens need, need to be treated with respect and equal under the law. Period. Hello, I am a woman of faith, and so the God that I know doesn't discriminate. He loves everyone the same. And as a small business owner, it would hurt me uh, financially to have to hear some of these laws. Uh, we'll see what happens uh, down the line with the Texas legislature. Uh, there was a bill, and the bill is still um, morphing, or amendments are being brought up still. So until that happens, you know, City Council can reach in. Um, other than that, uh, I will say that everyone matters, every vote matters. It doesn't matter what color or where you're from or what gender uh, you associate yourself with. I ask you again for your vote humbly. Thank you. Uh, I supported the NDO. I believe that it really represents civil rights for everybody and human rights for everybody. And so I would be opposed to any changes to our non discrimination ordinance. Thank you. My view is that the NDO was really not a city issue. The non discrimination ordinance and what is in it is really based uh, more appropriately on federal law 
of state law. It's being determined as we speak, both in the Congress of the United States and the state legislature and in our courts. It was introduced in the city, the city council is a wedge and issue to divide people. And I think that uh, my view is that we follow federal law, state law, whether it's the non-discrimination, whether it's non-discrimination, defense of marriage, uh, recognition of same-sex marriage, or whatever. I don't believe in discriminating against anybody, but I believe in following federal and state law, and I don't really believe this should be a city issue. Uh, as a business owner, when I go to employ someone to look at their uh, application, I can't discriminate. I have to look at their skills that they bring to my business. As a city councilwoman, I can't discriminate. I have to look at every individual that comes and has an issue to this to this district. I do oppose the idea in this regard. The words gender identity. I think we're all new to that term, and it's very fluid. So anybody can identify with anything at any time, anywhere, at any place. And I have some concerns about that in the NDO. What is gender identity? And that's the concern of, 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 of Gavin Bill as well. That is fluid. You can determine at any time you want. And honestly, I have some questions and concerns about that one. We're going to start with Marco Barros. A new issue that has come up, the reimagined Alamo Plaza. There is lots of outrage online, not only about the plan itself, but about the process involved and lack of citizen input. For big projects like this, how would you want to see City Council approach them? And do you have an opinion about this project? <laughs> That, that, that question probably would be a two-hour answer, but um, there have been two uh, public uh, meetings so far, and to my understanding, I have talked to Becky Finn, who uh, works for the Alamo, that there will be additional meetings coming up, uh, one next week, and I think they're going to have more public input meetings. So I, um, I've been hearing a lot, I'm a very good listener about this. Um, now that the plans have been presented, you can follow all this, on, uh, by the way, on their website side that we imagine the Alamo. Uh, there are some issues personally that I disagree with. Uh, I don't think that we should remove any of those trees in front of the Alamo. As I will tell you, I go through the air almost daily for meetings uh, in that area. Uh, if you eliminate the trees, there's no shade. And I will tell you, in July, it gets very, very hot. So there are some areas that I disagree. Uh, there's some concerns about traffic. So I would love Welcome all your input because I think it, your input is more valuable than, than anyone else's. Um, and there's also some issues about funding. They do not have all the funding. Well, this is a, a topic we discussed a lot at Aggie Muster last night, and uh, I think it's a travesty to, de to uh, decimate the Alamo and its historic nature. Now, this is uh, needs to be the will of the people, it's an opinionable issue. It's we need to honor our past. And by having somebody that a designer out of Philadelphia come down who has no appreciation of the historic nature of Texas and its independence and its fight for independence, uh, to come and want to scrape out all the grass, remove all the trees, and put a, uh, a clear box around the Alamo that, that, that regulates how you can see it uh, is deplorable. Uh, deplorable. And the uh, uh, suspend for the state and the city's money is a complete waste of money. To move the syntax where it's at the monument that honors all of, our, all of the, uh, the warriors and is unconscionable to me. It needs to be front and center where it is to stay there. We need to do, make sure whatever plans we do honors our veterans, honors the people who fought and died for the freedom we enjoy today. My definition of a, a good question is one that I can answer. And presently, I, I can't answer the question about the Alamo because I don't have enough information on it. So I would want to get as much information as I could. I would want to talk to as many people in District 9 as I could. And then after thinking long and hard, I would make a decision and do it. I don't like the fact that our Alamo is 
is going to look like it's in a petri dish. Um, that is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, I was born and grew up here and visited the Alamo several times. I do not believe they have the money at this time to fund that project. Again, it's premature to think about it, but uh, my position is I do not like the plan at all at this time. Again, it looks like a petri dish and it is not, uh, and it, it just does not resemble um, what we stand for, what the Alamo stands for, and so it's absolutely an inappropriate master plan. And again, they do not have the money for it. And if they did bring up the money, it's most likely for special interest groups that just want to make a lot of money uh, pouring concrete. It, it just goes on and on and on. It has no benefit to us in my personal and humble opinion. Opposed to doing anything else to the animal other than maintenance to keep it uh, clean and, and well uh, taken care of. The animal is the number one tourist attraction in Texas. It has been for years. It will be. It will continue to be for years. So I don't think we need to be investing millions of dollars to try and recreate the, the history from almost 200 years ago. So I would be opposed to that. Uh, let the animal remain what it is. The symbol it's been has been very good for. The United States of Texas. All I know about the project is what I read in the newspaper, but I'm concerned. Number one, uh, a glass wall uh, mimicking what was supposedly the walls of fortification around the country is not recreated the way it felt. Moving the Cenotaph, which is the, basically the cemetery and burial monument to the defenders of the Alamo, to me, would be a travesty. When I go to Gettysburg, I'm not offended by the fact that there are monuments around the Gettysburg battlefield showing where different uh, units were uh, employed and where people died. And that doesn't detract from if you visit the battlefield, it actually makes it better. Uh, I think that we can do better things with some of the, the buildings that have a history of their own opposite the outlaw, remove some of the junk. Uh, Ripley's fleet or not type things and make those uh, venues for historical uh, exhibits and all, and there's a lot of other things that we can do. We need to reconsider the project for improving Alamo Plastic. Oh dear Lord, how many times are we going to re recreate downtown? I mean, Hemispheric Plaza has just gone through another recreation. I don't know if you're all aware of, we're going to have a street now that goes where the where the playground was in Hemispheric Plaza. So then we got rid of the convention center. We have no parking, no parking downtown anymore. So now we're going to go over to the Alamo and recreate that, which by the way, your money has already been spent for that design. And by the way, you were never told the redesign was even being talked about. Now you're being told, come to the public meeting, but the public meeting is only to show you what they already want to do and convince you that it's a great thing to do. Totally against the process. Totally against the project. And this is where District 9 has the muscle to start to push back because our tax dollars, we spend the most here, are going down to these projects that are just brainstormed in somebody's bathroom office. I'm totally opposed to that process. Totally Okay. Um, here. Okay. Uh, for me, it's actually a personal issue. Um, I had family who bought me a I'm related to Jose Machaca, and for me, uh, when I look at that size of that thing, I think it, it, it's supposed to give you a reflection that, yeah, it's small. See, the whole idea behind this project is because people come here, they go, that's, that's it. It's so tiny. But yeah, that's it. It's because you had a small group of men who gave their lives for the community. Uh, you know, my, the relative that I was with, his name was Jose Machaca, he, he was sent away by William Travis right before the, the siege really started with this family. Because he knew Santa Ana killed him and his wife. It was a bad guy. 
That was the tyranny they were dealing with. And see, it's supposed to represent that this idea that here's us, we're small, but our voices matter, and we're willing to give our lives for that. And that's, that's what I think that Alamo represents to me, and I wanted to continue representing that. But we can't do it the way it's the way this point is. Thank you. Okay, we'll be starting the next question with Mr. Don Dolan. Do you support the bond issue? Why or why not? Uh, in total, I do not support the bond package. Uh, there are pieces of the bond package which are very important in, 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 uh, to uh, our safe thoroughfares, to and from the school and work, to get back home safely, officially. We've done a poor job. We've done the job of planning, and we can do better. It's important that we do better in our planning ahead for streets, drainage, and uh, so we can live safely, have, have a safe environment, and uh, have plenty of public safety that's present and can run and can help our uh, family members in need. There are, yet the uh, we're in a situation, as I mentioned in my first comments, that one of the path if we pass the bond package in total, it's a trajectory to potentially exceed our total assets and be insolvent, insolvent in the next 20 years. So we need to focus on things that we need to have, not on things that, we, that are nice to have. And there's a lot of nice to have in, in that, a lot of special interest like work over $350 million of special interest projects like the land bridge over, over where by Parkway when the, when the animals are crossing underneath, and um, that's Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, whenever you get my ass, what was the question? <laughs> no, I'm not just kidding. Uh, the bond issue is I relate to whenever, in the service, whenever you have to close the base, they don't ask the individual politicians, they give it to a committee, and then that committee makes the recommendations and you either vote up or down. When you look at any large project, it's just bond issues, you can always find things you don't like, things that could be better. Things that could be better. But all in all, I think it's a very good it's a very good bond issue for the city. It will then benefit the economics of the city and, and the, the jobs for the city. And so therefore I support it. As a whole, I cannot support it. I first uh, said that this is great um, and it appeared to be great until I started really digging and digging. And some of those, there are propositions in there saying so you can vote for yes, you can vote yes for some and vote no for others. Unfortunately, the way that it is put together is kind of tricky. Like um, public art is here and there in some of the proposals, and uh, along with EMS and police. I just think it's in properly places. In my opinion, I think they put this thing together and in haste and it needed to have a lot more uh, insight and input by the public and what is best for the public. I don't think this happened. Um, I do agree on some of the things like the senior citizen center that we will be facing in District 9. Thank you. I support the bond issue. I support it because I've looked at it. Uh, I've had people help me in my campaign who've helped me do the research. And basically, for District 9, the overall benefit is going to be about $90 million. Over $60 million is directly into District 9 through a lot of different projects. The other 25 or so million uh, is in projects on District 8 and District 10 that benefit the people who live in District 9 because we drive through those streets. We get out here. We get out of Blanco. We get out of San Pedro. We use 1604. So a lot of the projects in that bond issue are in, yes, in District 8, District 10, but the people who live in the north central part of San Antonio will benefit by about $90 million worth of the improvements in this bond issue. So I support it. I encourage you to look closely at it. I hope you'll support it too. So, Mr. Das, um, many of you may not be aware that you spent the whole month of July working on the city budget and priorities for the year, so uh, there was no uh, city council meetings in the month of July because you actually spent all the time working on the city budgets and reviewing over 21 city departments. Uh, so my uh, 
Number one priority is to really look at the details of budget. Number two, public safety. Uh, I think that we only have two classes at the police academy right now. That's the main reason why we're very short in recruiting our police officers. We got to figure out with the help of Chief McManus and Anthony Trevino, the assistant director, on how to increase the number of classes at the police academy. And number three is look at public safety from the fire department, the response time, and we're short in ambulances, EMS, and a few fire trucks, so we got to do something about that. First and foremost is we have not appointed citizen task force uh, to address crime and public safety. Another citizen task force to address development services department and make sure that the rules that they abide by are very objective and comprise the business owners. And third is reprioritize city spending. Uh, the budget will be upon us. Uh, also, uh, we would look at things like the Alamo area plaza, the $7.3 of the bond is going to go to, to uh, reconstructing the Alamo, how we can you know, work to protect the Alamo from that. But third is transparency. So real quick, Chris, this is the task force on crime and public safety is we need to look at crime districts, we need to look at increasing and publicizing, making more people aware of what so far implemented in uh, car reports, citizen action reports where you can be responded to by the district office and make sure people know about that. Uh, the development services department has been city to uh, not follow objective guidelines. We need to make sure that we have responsible government, responsible development. Thank you very much. Okay, Ms. Martinez, the airman? The airman? The airman, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, there are three very similar questions here, and some of you just touched on this as your priorities, but maybe this will give you an opportunity to expand on it. Um, what can we do to reduce our violent crime rate that is up by 9% in San Antonio? Um, FBI ranks number five in the county for property crime. And inner city San Antonio violent crime rate rose just shy of 10% in 2015 16. So, if we can address your positions on crime. Absolutely. I think that one of the things that um, I'm not seeing in this bond is a lot of uh, thought uh, and foresight of. Helping um, inter intervention and prevention for mental health care needs. I think that there's a, a very large uh, or influx of domestic violence issues that have been not been addressed um, from a mental health standpoint. The state does not provide a whole lot of money for that. And so I'd like to see some of that change in the future. Um, it would benefit us all. Now, if you ask uh, another question now, as far as the FBI is concerned, poverty does drive criminal activities. So we're going to have a lot, um, we have a lot of great responsibility as city council members to make sure that we are, in a way, empowering our citizens to be able to obtain jobs. And, and that I do uh, agree with. Mayor Ivy's plan, and also a living way, so that is Mr. Medina's plan. So I respectfully again ask for your vote. So. As I mentioned, the police department is understaffed. We need to expand the training programs that we have at our police academy. Uh, as been pointed out by one of our other board members earlier, even SAC has a law enforcement training program that we can take advantage of. So I think that's one aspect of it. Also, I think that we need to go ahead and, and help our citizens recognize that they can take some more responsibility by getting involved on citizens on patrol in their neighborhood. I think that's a good program. I've been involved in it in my neighborhood too. Uh, I think that we can go ahead and, and help better educate our police department to work better with the different communities that we have in the city. We also have a safe program uh, where we have specific police officers who work with neighborhoods to uh, help the communication between the, commu the community and the police department. We need to expand the number of safe officers that we have so that we don't have so many. Are a safe officer handling 20 or 30 different neighborhoods. 
and so that we have better communication between the people in the neighborhood and the police department. I hate following John because we saw all the agreements on these things. Uh, there are two aspects to decreasing crime. One is to increase uh, police presence and police patrols. And uh, as numerous people have mentioned, we are short of police. We're over 200 short. We've had a policy that San Antonio Police Department will only hire people trained through its own police academy. Even though we have a San Antonio College or San Antonio Community Colleges, a law enforcement program in which our police department won't hire people from. I know that because my nurse's son went through that program and was not considered for hiring. We also do not hire police that are trained by other cities and municipalities police departments. Secondly, we have judges that are not anymore sending people to jail for non-violent crimes, which includes theft, burglary. Etc. We need to get back to the idea that we actually punish criminals once we catch them to serve as a victim. I'm in favor of SB6, and that is the state starting to declare these sanctuary cities. So I would propose that the city of San Antonio have an ordinance or resolution that declares itself a non sanctuary city. Studies have shown, sorry, I saw that in the back. Studies have shown that when you declare yourself non-sanctuary, your crime leaves. And we know, we know McManus plays this little game of having informants protected because they're illegal and apparently he gets some information on how to go track the gay people who are here, even though they themselves are, are lawbreakers. San Bernardino declared themselves a non-sanctuary city. San Bernardino, California where you would have a lot of this crime going on, and they saw that crime leave. We have rising crime, not because you and I are doing anything wrong, but because our, our police chief is not making a statement, our mayor is not making a statement that's definitive that we are a non-sanctuary city. Okay, uh, I have a lot of personal experience of being a victim of crime, uh, especially as a resident of District 9, just share that with you. I've been robbed at gunpoint, I've had my car vandalized, I've had the parking where I was at burned down because of gang initiation, I've had uh, two friends murdered here in town, I have had my store backed into a, uh, by a truck not once but twice, and this is just becoming very, very common for my age generation, especially here in San Antonio. And it's going to get probably more common. It's an economic issue. We talk about jobs, creating jobs. We all do that. But there's no focus on it whatsoever. It's about development, it's about growth, but never about actual creation. Uh, how, how are we going to attract businesses? How, how are businesses going to develop? Uh, you know, that, that's a that's going to be your major issue. The second is personal responsibility. Going into those communities, we need to be more active as a community, not just in our own areas, but going to those areas where they do not have good role models. That is a fact. If they do not have people around them showing them, hey, if you work hard, you can make yourself something. That's what we do. To, uh, to reduce crime, uh, it's going to take all of us in this room. And I can tell you that we, uh, we're we short of police officers, that's one reason, but the response time with only six substations in town, and the north side keeps growing, growing, growing on 281. I can tell you that I've had lots of conversations with a lot of neighbors in District 9 that probably we will, in the next couple of years, we will need another police substation uh, near Encino Park, Stone Oak, in that area because the response time right now from Blue Road to here is more than 20 minutes. And from John Smalls Burger to here could take 15, 17 minutes. So uh, we, we got to be more proactive and it's going to take all of us to do that. The recruitment of uh, police officers is very, very important. And I think we also need to look at retired military people that have that kind of background. As I mentioned before, I was looking at Citizen, Front, uh, Citizen Task Force on to address crime in your neighborhoods, but let's start with the city. Uh, we are undermanned, uh, understaffed, on police, and we need to make sure that we address and encourage our police chief to get the business in, uh, in beginning training and, and utilize other military programs uh, to come into the workforce. 
one of the great things my son has, has been on uh, part of the Explorers uh, program with, with uh, the SAFE office in, and um, Jones Mossberg, and the, uh, I would encourage that to encourage other young young people to uh, consider the police uh, police work and uh, not a professional profession. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, we don't continue annexing uh, outside of the city a mandatory annexation where uh, we extend our, our core services out and stretch into any one business uh, corridor where it slows down response times here locally. Uh, with, the, with this district standpoint, when you look at crime districts, when you look at uh, how do we utilize other programs like Deerfield does, hiring off-duty policemen to patrol the neighborhoods. Last, I would look at personal responsibility and license to carry and encourage people to act responsibly. Back in my good position in my list. <laughs> a couple of things could be done. First, we could have the policy of fully staffing, fully training, and fully equipping, equipping our, our police department. And another thing we could do is have a policy that we would have no annexation of new areas until we were absolutely certain that our existing districts were adequately covered. Thank you. Mr. Courage, we're going to start this question with you. Is there any possibility that the school tax portion of our property taxes may be reduced? We understand that the school tax is the largest portion of our property tax bill. Do you anticipate that retirees can be given any property tax relief? I don't think so. You know, I'm pretty close to being retired myself. I think that the problem that we have with our taxes in this area are twofold. One is that we continue to grow, and the more we grow, the more they're going to be building more schools, and the more you're going to be paying higher school taxes. That's inevitable as long as we have the unbridled, uncontrolled growth along the north side that we've had for the last 20 years. That's why I support smart growth. That's why I support the city incentivizing growth in other areas of the city that are underdeveloped. Also, when it comes to taxes, we find that a lot of private interests, a lot of commercial property, uh, a lot of apartment complexes are sold, but we don't know what the prices are because they're sold for one dollar and other valuable consideration. And so they're undervalued when it comes to paying their share of the tax base. And who makes up that difference? You and I, the residential owner. So the city needs to fight with the state to improve the laws that will have full disclosure of prices of property sold in the commercial area. The city and the city council has very little uh, input in, into uh, school district taxes. They're an independent taxing entity. The state legislature sets levels that they can tax, and we do have lobbyists uh, that work for the city that uh, work with the state legislature so we can try to influence on that, influence it on that level. The property taxes in general uh, are uh, high, and I think that it, property taxes have two components. One is the tax rate, and the other is the appraised value. And one of the things that I feel strongly about is that for your primary residence, your house should be appraised at the sales price and only reappraised either at the time of resale or when uh, you've done extensive uh, renovation or modification. Otherwise, people are taxed out of their primary residences, or at least potentially, and I think that would be a travesty. Well, I do think that we need to move from an appointed appraised board to an elected appraised board. Uh, I'm not sure who they're working for right now. They're working against me and you. Uh, change a bathroom, put in a new window, put in a ceiling fan, and you will be appraised, your value is going to be appraised higher. And they know that because they look through your window and make sure what you're doing. So I would go from an elected, from an appointed to an elected. Um, I'm not for uh, opening up what you sold your property for. It's private property, and it's your it's your transaction. It's <coughs> private. I don't think it needs to be public out there. Although you can find what somebody sold their property for. It's not that hard to do right now. Okay, for me, you kind of have to look globally and see what other countries have done around the world. 
for um, us, we pay those property taxes and then we bear the burden of educating the kids. In other places across the world, what they do is that the businesses already realize the incentive and without being taxed, they automatically pay for those things. Why? Well, it's because they realize they need an educated populace to pay for those schools. They need it. They, it's not a question of whether they need it. They know it. And uh, especially when you think about a global market, they know that that's just something we have to do. Um, you know, for us, property tax just in general is, is very, very aggressive, even though it's considered very fair. Because the people who are uneducated lack the ability to know what their house is worth. And somebody who comes in with all these rules, regulations, will go up to them and go, oh no, this is what it's worth now. And they're just like, oh, okay. And that's what they, they really do think that. It's just because they don't know. And I think that's those type of things you just kind of have to stop. Um, you have to make it fair for them. You have to let them have good uh, financial incentives. Um, just want to make sure I do know that I'm for no tax increases or any sort, um, property taxes or school tax or all that. Unfortunately, this is an issue that has to be solved at the state level by your state representatives and your state senators. So uh, those are the people that really have a lot more input than the city council on all this. I do agree, though, that eventually, um, you, you know, you go and fight on, a, on, a, on an appraisal value of your home, uh, and unfortunately, uh, we don't have a lot of uh, solutions and options, so I do agree that eventually we need to really push uh, our city officials to uh, have elected uh, members of the appraisal board. This goes to an overarching issue with the city of San Antonio and rightly prioritizing its spending. Because if we were not spending things on, that are nice to have and focus on things that are need to have, or basic necessities, core services, infrastructure, and not on special interest projects, we wouldn't have a burden that was placed on property tax owners and particular residential owners. So partly we're just reprioritizing uh, the city's spending. Second is we need to get the city manager where we uh, adjust her compensation at her at fair minimum, and where we tie any bonus compensation to her balancing budget. We relieve property tax pressure. We do need to uh, lobby as a city to have Bear County, uh, the county appraisal district changed to where it's elected members. And we also need to make sure that uh, commercial properties are, are properly assessed to relieve that burden. And the process for appealing your property tax increases needs to be uh, uh, streamlined where you're not having to pay a $500 fee to go to the state to appeal to the state and to make, make the burden less. Uh, the last part is that we need to make sure that uh, citizens are knowing that projects like this, are, and special interest projects, do have the potential to increase your, your tax rates. So we need to make sure to be conscious of and how we're voting and, and what we're supporting in special interest projects. Uh, I'm not an expert on tax law, but I, I would be very interested in pursuing if there were some way we could stabilize the property tax for those who reach retirement age. I don't know if that would be this issue is not an issue that city council has uh, too much power control over. This is a legislative issue. Uh, we will, as a city council member, um, as a whole, city council and the mayor, need to learn how to work hand in hand with Texas legislators uh, so that they could be apprised of how San Antonio is doing business and how it is affecting our constituents, especially District 9. Uh, earlier we talked about the bond and 12% of the bond that uh, is at stake, uh, $850 million is coming back uh, out of $850 million, 12% is coming back. I, uh, John Courage, uh, he's uh, ran for several uh, offices before and knows that um, as is, uh, working for uh, or trying to get into these positions, you know, we have to really learn uh, not to um, speak uh, ill of our Texas legislators or city council members, which we need to Thank you. And if you would hold on to that microphone, because we are still going to do the closing statements. Um, just out of mercy for the candidates. I know we were supposed to go to 12, but we've gotten in most of our questions. 
I'm going to read this one last question because I think it's important. Um, and I'm going to ask you to just think about this as you're doing your closing remarks. And we will have the closing remarks be two minutes, since we are going to stop a little early. Um, but before I do that, I do want to thank again um, the sponsors who have helped us out here today, the Vineyard Homeowners Association, Sylvia Lucas from Melcast SA for taking this. And certainly thank you to the candidates who have come out here and shivered through a little bit about <laughs> So something to think about. A councilman's job is basically a full-time commitment. They have to be at council meetings Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of each week. There are a multitude of meetings day and evenings, appointments with constituents, etc. Are you prepared for the position you are wanting to be voted for as a full-time job? It's not just a few hours a day. So if you want to think about maybe incorporating that in your closing statements, it's up to you. But um, So we're going to start two minutes with you. We go in the reverse order of opening. Okay. Um, well, I thank you again for having me here, giving me this opportunity. And uh, I definitely have to say that I am privileged uh, to have been raised in San Antonio. And the city council, um, as it stands at this time, is in need of, it's in need of a leadership that um, has never been seen before. I think an integrated approach, uh, such as um, Doc had made reference to having different folks in our city council with different skill sets would make this a much more um, influential city council. And I pray for that. I hope that that's what happens. I hope it's not just a launching board for some young folks so they can dump us in you know, the next a congressional election or whatnot. Um, it's very disconcerting to find that that's what's happening here. Um, I do not plan, uh, um, when elected, I, I do not plan uh, to further my political career. I like to stay by a tiny mall somewhere out yonder, up to sunset. That's, that's where I would like to be. Um, I will say this as a Licensed professional counselor, I have a license to uphold an ethics that I need to um, follow through with and I'm held accountable. So uh, I bring those same ethics to the city of San Antonio um, as a victim of domestic violence, as a victim of a home invasion, um, but specifically as a, a victim of domestic violence. Um, I am here actually to humbly um, apologize for not voting in the last several years. I was relocated and I was not able to because I was afraid. Um, but I'm back and I'm not afraid to vote and I'm not afraid to be here to let you know. And the perpetrator lives here in San Antonio and I'm the great home that I'm back. It was, uh, again, great to be with you. And you, you all should be commended for sitting here and listening to us give our spills because you are that big democracy great. And I also want to comment on my fellow candidates because they're an outstanding group. And no matter which you choose, you will have a good representative, I can assure you. Uh, in summary, I would like to mention the issues again that I think are very important for District 9 in that we need to get our traffic flowing. We need to get proper staffing of our police, our fire, fire departments, and our EMS. We need to get more districts because these districts have been stretched out to where they're too large for the land area and population. And lastly, uh, I think we need to consolidate our elections so that we have our city elections on even number of years and we save a couple million every other year. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to be with uh, the folks that will come out and uh, listen and, and make ex excellent choices. And uh, I want you to know that if, uh, I, if you would like me to be your representative, it would be an honor to be your voice on City Hall, and I will be there full time. Thank you. 
Well, thank you. You've made your act of charity for the week and uh, enduring each of us, but also the, the, the breeze and the coolness. And uh, thank you, Phyllis, and thank you uh, to all the sponsors, including League of Women Voters. When I go down to University of Carnot Word, the village where all the retired uh, sisters live, um, I get a chance to see they always have the League of Women Voters guys out there in, in, uh, in great numbers, so I was glad to be a part of this. Uh, my name is Patrick Bondo. I did get permission from my wife, Happy, to run for the uh, District 9. I did get permission from my business partner, uh, that those two people in my life are integral, and uh, to do the, to doing that, I have been blessed to, to be, uh, uh, as a private business owner, uh, to have the success enough to be able to dedicate full time and to address your issues that are important to you to help you. Uh, Baby values, common sense, and a conservative, independent voice is what I intend to bring to you, and one that is always approachable, that's responsive, that will listen. And uh, my wife says that that's, what, that's why she's still married to me after 20 years, is that I do listen to her. And uh, but uh, the uh, in doing so and going forward, it's important and crucial that we make sure that we focus on core services, our infrastructure to make your life and improve our quality of life. We've done some good things, but we can do better. And with your help, I intend to do that as representing you. For over six years, of, uh, over 20 years, I've lived here in the same area, and in over six years, I've been uh, active as a private citizen in working and engaged in the public sphere downtown, representing private uh, property owners, business owners, uh, primarily homeowners in the work that we've done downtown. and. Uh, so I look forward to serving as your city councilman. Vote Patrick out of Oregon. You can find out more information. Vote Patrick out of Oregon. Vote Patrick SA on, on social media. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, this is a full-time job. Uh, I can tell you that uh, based on my 20 years of experience with working with a lot of city council members, um, you're appointed to about four committees. Uh, all those committee meetings take place on Tuesday. This session takes probably your entire Wednesday afternoon, and zoning cases and regular A session takes all day Thursday. So you're making a huge commitment. One of the things that I want to make more accessible, based on the experience of working with team council members, the district office, which is located on Thousand Oaks and 21, is really not fully accessible to everyone. One of the things that I will do for you as uh, representing you and your voice and your concerns is open the district office on Saturday mornings and make it more accessible to people and hear your concerns. I'm a very good listener. Uh, if you read the Express News today, I've been endorsed by the San Antonio Express News because of my experience of doing this for over 20 years and living in the district for 30 years. I also have endorsement of the past four council members of District 9 that represent you, Joe Pryor, uh, Lisa Chan, Tim Van Wolf, and Kevin Wall. So I work on their campaigns, I know what it takes, and I know I've, I've been involved in writing many of the city ordinances, including state the state um, uh, affairs also. So I do have the experience to get all this done and represent you and uh, work on your behalf. I'm a very good listener. I also know the time commitment that it takes and to visit all the homeowners and all the residents with any issues that come up. Thank you for your vote and support. Phyllis, thank you for doing this. So to answer that question, how are we do give away more than full time? I have a I do keep a normal job right now currently working eight to five, and then when I go from there, I then campaign to about two a.m. every morning. I actually do go to the houses. I'll go out to uh, to the local uh, bars, pubs, to try to meet the young kids because they don't vote. I mean, they don't. They don't. They don't have to. They decide. They don't think it's important. And sometimes they're more surprised that somebody's actually willing to go out there and go speak with them. I repeat this day in and day out, every single day. Uh, I give all my time for my community, and regardless of whether I get elected or not, I'm still going to be giving my time to the community. That's what I went to school for, because I care. I'm going to continue to care. It doesn't matter. You are going to hear my voice more and more often. <laughs> Uh, you may get tired of it, I promise you. <laughs> but, um, you know, if you, uh, if you support me, I guarantee you that I will make sure that your voices get better, not just mine. You can go to uh, go to Matt Pena for social media, and just go to mattpena.com if you guys want to look a little bit more on my so, Thank you. 
I have enjoyed uh, sitting next to Matt. Seems like we're always holding up next to Matt. And, but I've enjoyed his fresh approach. Uh, bars and clubs, I haven't tried that one, but never know. <laughs> it is a full-time job. But I've been in business 26 years. When you're self-employed, you're more of a full-time job. And especially when you raise a family. So that's nothing new to me. I like that. Uh, so I will be down there at those meetings. But those meetings, they need to come outside those doors and out to you. I can sit in meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting, but if you know nothing of what I have went through for you, then have I really served you? Is it so hard for anybody to write an ordinance? Is it so hard for any of us here to get to know Lisa Chan, Joe Pryor, Dan Van We all know them. We all work with them to some capacity. But what we haven't done is taken what we know and given it out to you. That empowerment is what will make District 9 the muscle that it needs to be. With this many tax dollars going out of this district down to other districts, we should have a very solid and a very strong and a very loud voice at City Hall. Those ordinances should be in our favor, I think. Those meetings should be in our favor for District 9, our tax dollars that are hard work and hard earned. And that's what I represent. I'm fearless. That's one thing I just want to say. You're fearless. I'm fearless. And I will work hard for you. Uh, I won't put in 80 hours. I do have a family and grandkids, but I will work very hard for you. Thank you, Phyllis. This has been the coldest venue I've been to. <laughs> I'm originally from Ohio, and you think I'd be used to this, but that's why I moved. Um, and thank you um, as well. I've enjoyed working with you, and all of these candidates are just fun people. Um, I think we'll all meet at a bar afterwards. <laughs> I want to thank Phyllis and the League of Women Voters for putting on this final debate of this campaign season. It's been a great learning experience, a great, uh, and, and a lot of fun. And I'm proud to be on the dais with such a fine group of candidates. So whoever wins, I think District 9 will be well represented. Uh, you asked about whether we can serve a full-time job. Well, I just retired from the Texas State Guard and I closed my thoracic surgery practice. Well, when you're a thoracic surgeon, you usually work about 100 hours a week or 120 hours a week, so this would be a vacation for me. So uh, that, that would not be a problem. I awoke this morning to read the San Antonio Express News and their endorsement, and they uh, uh, endorsed their candidate based on living for 30 years in the district, uh, experience, and uh, his uh, unique ideas of improving traffic flow by uh, synchronizing our lights uh, and uh, uh, having better police protection. Well, every, all 10 candidates have had those same basic ideas. What I bring to this fight is a different background and experience. Background experience in disaster planning with the State Guard, background and experience in healthcare and biotech, and a background and experience in the military, and a background and experience in leadership based on my education and on my professional career. Uh, I do not believe that we should have a city government based on cronyism, which we've had in the past. I promise you that if elected, I will be an honest, faithful servant of you and the people, all of the people of San Antonio. I hope you'll vote for me. My name will be last of the candidates because of the uh, luck of the draw. So please go all the way down on the ballot and vote for Dave and Dr. Thank you. I too want to thank the League and the Vineyard uh, Organization for allowing us to be here. You've heard a lot from all of us today, and many of us have a lot of the same ideas. And that's good, and I know it's a hard choice to make. I ask you to make the choice for me because I think I best represent you as just somebody who's been living in this neighborhood, who's been working in the neighborhood, who's been raising their family. I feel like I'm your neighbor. The guy on the other side of the fence that you talk with about what's going on on the street or the block or what has to be done in the neighborhood or what are the problems that you hear about down the street. And I want to be your neighbor on the San Antonio City Council. I've listened to people. I've knocked on thousands of doors over this campaign. 
I've actually had citizens to be heard in my office every week for the last two months, and people have come by either on a Wednesday or Thursday to talk with me about their concerns. I've spent Saturday mornings at coffee shops in this district just talking to people about what their concerns are. I'm already making this a full-time job. I'm a teacher, I'm retiring at the end of this year. There's nothing else I want to do other than represent you and your interests and do that in a way that the entire city will be improved by the decisions I make. As I said, a councilman for one district is really a councilman for all. The decisions the city council makes will affect you and your neighbors and everyone else in this city. And we need to think about that that's why I know I can do this full time. I can cooperate. I can collaborate. I can be a leader that you'll be proud of. I hope you'll learn more about me if you haven't made up your mind yet by going to John Courage or CourageForNine.com. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out this chilly morning. Thank you to the parents who have their children here so that they can experience for themselves how our democracy works. Um, I wish I had hot coffee for all of you, but I don't. <laughs> Some of the candidates who did not respond in the printed voter guides were able to get their responses on vote411.org. So if you want to know more about um, any of the mayoral candidates or um, other I guess most of you responded. <laughs> um, on behalf of the League of Women Voters, I really do thank you for coming out and for sharing with us your vision for our district and for our city.